So we'd like to talk about the history of Europe, the history of change in animal life. Uh, and I'm here in the Yorkshire Dales, limestone country, and I'm here with Tom Lord, who's brought me here to see this glacial erratic. Why have we come here, Tom? This is um, a block of hard sandstone from a rock formation which formed before and is underneath the limestone. So it's been brought here by a process which was first identified in the mid 19th century by a Victorian geologist who recognised that this block was brought here by land ice, by a great glacier formerly covering the entire area of the Yorkshire Dales and which we now know went further south down the western side of Britain. And that must have enormously changed thinking to realise that there's a great ice block here. So, um, so, so, so what happened as a consequence of this work? Well, the, the presence of an ice sheet was clearly evidence of climate change in the past. This was recognised at the time as what was called an ice age, and that was thought to be a single cold event. And what the Victorians wanted to know, what was here before what they then called the Ice Age. And what they reasoned was that the glacier here would have removed any surface deposits from earlier times, but older deposits, older than their Ice Age, might be found in limestone caves here. And I guess because it's limestone, the, as you can see here, it's been cut by the, a slightly acidic rain, creating these holes and caves. Uh, and that, I guess, means that that's why these limestone caves are so rich. Shall we? Um, um... Limestone dissolves in rainwater, and the surface of the limestone here has dissolved since a block got put here by a glacier. And this block of limestone here, the depth of it gives an indication of how much limestone has disappeared through solution since the last glaciation. Fascinating. So, um, so if you go and have a look at some of these caves. Let's go up to Victoria Cave, the most famous of the caves. Excellent. Look forward to that. So as we've just shown, the Victorians realised that ice ages existed and that caves would be a good place to look for early life. And so we're in Victoria Cave. Uh, Tom, what are, we, what are we seeing here? Why have you brought me here? Well, the Victorian scientists come here in 1870 looking for deposits older than the last ice sheet they knew covered this landscape during the Ice Age. So they're looking here for evidence of life before the last Ice Age, which was a major geological datum in their way of thinking, which gave them something to estimate how old events were before the last ice age. And so this would be all full of sediment at that time? Before the excavations, this was filled within a metre or two beneath the roof of the existing cave. So we've got a very thick sequence, several metres of sediments here, which were subsequently removed. And the top layer was they knew was from the glacial period, is that As right? they dug down, they encountered a thick layer of finely laminated muds, which they reasoned must have formed when a glacier was dumbing the outside of the cave, preventing water getting out, and the water was fed from annual meltwater with mud coming off the glacier. So anything below that was pre-glacial? You know, so... In their way of thinking, in their way of thinking, anything below that was exactly pre-glacial and so very old. So what did they find? Well, they had to dig a deep shaft because of the extent of the sediments. They had mm -hmm. to get a deep shaft dug close to the entrance and at a depth of something like six or seven metres, they encountered a layer of bones, uh, mostly brought into the cave by hyenas and included uh, mega herbivores, which are quite fantastic when we look at mm -hmm. them. And also for a time, they identified this tiny fragment of bone here. Amongst all the bones brought into the cave by hyena, they identified this as an early human. And this tiny bone, part of a leg bone, 
It's part of a large mammal leg bone, was identified as human and so before the last ice age. Which is obviously revolutionary. This is, you know, the missing link. This is when Darwinism is being heavily discussed. This must have been an incredibly exciting discovery. This was the first time they could put some kind of age onto what they thought was an early human from a cave anywhere in Europe. And were the media, was the media excited by this? Absolutely. They spun it and it got masses of publicity, masses of funding were brought forward and enabled excavations to continue in the cave for the next five years. Wow. And so I guess this is, this is the cutting edge of science, that they've, um, that they've, they've discovered this light evidence for early hu humans, they've, uh, they've discovered all of this extra life. So, um, so this is most exciting science that you can imagine. At the time, they're using absolutely cutting-edge technology. They're taking photographs as they go with the excavations and they're recording each bone in great detail so they could precisely put it into uh, a particular bed within the cave. So a huge success. Wonderful, wonderful. However, after five years, they failed to find another bone they could identify as human. So this tiny bone led to virtually emptying this big chamber here without giving rise to another find of a human bone beneath glacial sediments. But at least they have this one. They had this one. However, in 1878, the identification was rescinded and they no longer had this to hang on to as evidence of people in the Yorkshire Dales before the last ice age. So I guess really you can view this as a failure. So it was, it was considered as a big fanfare, lots of publicity, but it turned out that they didn't find other human life, that the human life they found turns out not to be human. It's all a bit of a scientific disaster, isn't it? It certainly damaged the reputation of some of the key scientists involved with the excavations. However, it has left us a legacy of a very careful, large-scale excavation of very old sediments. And we now know the sediments, this is through recent scientific uh, analysis, we now know that the sediments span a period of some half a million years. And there is evidence of not one glaciation, but five glaciations here at Victoria Cave, which is a unique record for any cave in Britain. And so we're, and we're going to go and have a look at that, I gather. And this is where the revolutionary science is. It's not actually in that bone. It's in all the other life that was found it's there. It's making sense of the sequence of deposits in this cave and also going into greater detail about some of the bone beds found in the cave. So let's go and have a look at them. We will. So these are the bones that were actually found under the glacial deposits in Victoria Cave. Tell, yeah. tell me about them. We have... We have the great extinct herbivores, extinct elephant, extinct rhinoceros, extinct bison and giant deer. These great big megafauna who are having a big impact on the landscape. They're opening it up. And here we've got a hippopotamus, a tusk of a hippopotamus, so something familiar to us today, but to have it living in the Yorkshire Dells is quite extraordinary. Today, we are familiar with the Ice Age. Um, we learn about it at school. We know in the past it was uh, sometimes were very cold and sometimes were great ice sheets, great glaciers over us. Now, for the Victorians, when they found this evidence for the first time, it was very new, it was very exciting to them. So the question is, of course, how did these bones get into the cave? We now know they were getting into the cave about 120,000 years ago. And they were taken into the cave by the predators. So we've got these big herbivores and we've got predators. And we have brown bear. This is the skull of a brown bear. We've got hyena and we've got lion. And hyena is the predator mostly responsible for taking these bones into the cave. So they're hunting and also scavenging, bringing bone back into the cave, which they're using as a communal den. 
but other predators use the cave at different times. Brown bears use the cave for hibernation. Occasionally a brown bear won't get through the winter and the carcass of the brown bear is then being scavenged by hyenas. So hyenas are both bringing bones into the cave and then when we have periods of bears hibernating, these are brown bears, they're scavenging. Now we've got lots of brown bear because they're being scavenged when they die in hibernation. Hyenas are using the cave as a communal den at times. Occasionally we have a lion bone. And out in the landscape we have interactions going on of course between bears, hyenas and lions and that's something we don't have anywhere in the world today. So we're seeing interaction between top predators that don't inhabit uh, the same landscapes today. And this is a story we can build on because we can come to this material today with a great battery of modern techniques and amplify this story. So these are not silent bones, they are going to go on telling us ever more about the landscapes they lived in. So it's just wonderful that when the Victorians did their excavation, they did it so thoroughly and ensured that these specimens were collated uh, and documented well. Uh, and it's fabulous, Tom, what you've done in terms of ensuring that collection stays together and also that it's still well documented. I know you had to go and, and retrieve the material, the, the documentation that was somewhere else and bring that together with the collection. And just fabulous that this is together in one place. Uh, and that you make it available. And I know lots of scientists have come, there's a whole string of papers, lots of important discoveries that come from this collection. Uh, I've just shown the, uh, the front cover of the Nature paper, showing the, uh, the front cover shows the, the dig that took place with the Victorians, but a whole slew of important studies. And I know that you've got plans for making this available in the future. Uh, there's the wonderful virtual museum, so you can actually look online, and I'll provide a link, so you can look at these specimens and then rotate them and see what they look like. Uh, and, um, and that's absolutely fabulous. And I know you've plans for making sure they'll be available for people in the longer term in some very public place. So um, this collection's extraordinary. Uh, and understanding this history, I guess, has a whole set of different roles. It's, it's important for understanding our past, so it's important for understanding prehistory. Uh, it provides lots of scientific information. Um, uh, it's important uh, think, in thinking about the ecology of this system and how this area arose. And I guess also it's very important culturally. This is an uh, astonishing area, the Yorkshire Dales, a fascinating area, but having this history makes them even more extraordinary. It brings a sense of wonder, and in the Yorkshire Dales National Park today, it's a special area where wildlife and nature is cared for, and I like to think part of that caring and understanding nature is thinking about and knowing about what has gone before.